This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Hey, my name is uh, Derek O'Brien, I'm here from Oxford, yes. Oxford Brooks University, and I'm being asked uh, by uh, Peter to uh, chair the first microphone panel. Um, what I plan to do is to allow the speaker 15 to uh, 20 minutes to present their papers, uh, and that will then be uh, plenty of time at the end for any questions from the audience. Uh, the first speaker this morning uh, is Andrew Cola, uh, who's going to present a paper titled Jamaica Jubilee, A Time for Renewed Nationalism. Uh, Andrew is a graduate of the University of West Indies, where he uh, graduated with a BSc in chemistry. Uh, during his time at uh, UE, uh, Andrew held several leadership roles. He was the uh, chairman of the Guild of Students, Cultural and Entertainment Affairs and uh, Student Achievement Committees. Um, paying homage to his uh, partial African heritage, uh, while in UE he also founded the African Caribbean Student Union uh, Committee. Uh, while at UE at a national le uh, level, Andrew has served as chairman of the Jamaican National Preparatory uh, Committee to the World Federation of Democratic Youth. He was president of the People's National Party Youth Organization, uh, a director of Jamaica's National Youth Service and has also given service as a director on Jamaica's Ministry of Industry and Tourism's Entertainment Advisory Board. Uh, while holding these leadership roles, Andrew served as an executive member of the uh, People's National Party uh, and the, uh, sat on the committee of the Government of Jamaica Task Force on Education and Community uh, Development. Uh, Andrew is uh, currently uh, studying the Bar Professional our professional uh, our practice training course, sorry, it's recently changed its name, at uh, BPP here in London, and uh, later in the year uh, he will be called to our So I'll ask Andrew to present. His Excellency, <coughs> High Commissioner of Jamaica, Alan Johnson, other members of the diplomatic corps, and staff of the Jamaican High Commission, <laughs> members of the organizing committee of this event, colleagues and Anna. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good morning. Before opening the batting in this one day innings, <laughs> I crave the indulgence if I may take a moment to recognize some persons here who are here. I want to first recognize Dr. Amanda Sachs. A uh, lady who knows a lot about Jamaica generally and about Jamaica's politics in particular. One who spent time listening to my ramblings about various issues that I contend with from time to time. I want to also especially recognize someone who you will hear certainly more about later today, Professor Mix, our keynote speaker within the audience. He is indeed a man of great insights and intellect, and I eagerly await his enriching contribution to this event today. I see, though, that there are persons who should be either preparing their draft of a defense and claim form for a bar program so that they can be called to the bar, or should be otherwise engaged in other academic activity, but they are here supporting me today, and I would only <coughs> be remiss of me to not recognize friends who are also here, um, Billine and uh, Janessa. Jamaica, land we love. Jamaica, Jamaica. Jamaica, land we love. 
that these sacred words of our national anthem must have been repeated countless in the minds of those who selfishly gave the sweat of their brow and the labor of their hands for the independence movement of our great nation, Jamaica and Cuba. In fact, today, Jamaica can take pride in a land that shines as a beacon of hope in a world increasingly ravaged by disastrous economic crisis, discontent, distress, and desperation. While Jamaica has by no means escaped this and these symptoms of modernity, our people stood shoulder to shoulder, whether in storm after storm, but never losing sight of constructing a Jamaica that is triumphant, a Jamaica that is proud, a Jamaica that is free. Indeed, we have enchanted the world with our music, stunned them with our athleticism, and captured them with a, with a vitality that I'm proud to say continues to burn 50 years after our independence. My contribution today, Jamaica's jubilee, a time for renewed national, nationalism, will be essentially on two points. First, I will attempt briefly to contextualize the dreams of our founding fathers and mothers. And second, I will share certainly what I see as an element of a dream of a new Jamaica. The leaders of our homeland throughout the ages, from Alexander Bustamante through to Norman Manley, from Norman Manley through to Michael Manley, and up to contemporary times, dreamt of a Jamaica that would ignite the ember of progress and prosperity nationally, regionally, and internationally. Norman Manley and the Band of Patriots and Digital Jamaica founded on socialist principles. His generation was instrumental in calculating what Jamaica urgently required as a newly politically independent nation. Figuratively speaking, his Jamaica could be linked to a gauge. Michael Manley's generation that followed was to lead Jamaica to greater economic independence. Again, figuratively speaking, the powerful imagery of the compass represents his generation. They modified and gave new directions to Norman Manley's somewhat purist socialist ideology. Therefore, in light of what I've already said, there's absolutely no doubt that the journey to greatness has been charted by the gauge. And there's absolutely no doubt that the coordinates of all success as a nation have been configured by the compass. Yet, it is undeniable that the world we inhabit has become a tangled web of unintended consequences where certainties are no rarities. Given these vagaries, is it time to dream again? It is my unwavering belief that the current and future generation must unite, figuratively speaking, in forming the square. We must embody a new nationalism, one that is renewed and free of the shackles of small-mindedness, free of the shackles of corruption, the shackles of falsity and a lack of consideration for what Jamaicans need to live dignified lives, what Jamaicans need to construct a good society. I am an unapologetic believer in the values of democratic existentialism. In leading this way to a renewed sense of nationalism. I say democratic because I reject entirely the purest form of socialism and capitalism, but support a mixture so far as they both protect the Jamaican people from the tyranny of the free market and an overbearing government, allowing them their creative space and allowing them room for the innovation to flourish in a free and fair environment. I say existentialist as I recognize that there must be a range of flexibility in our thinking when dealing with situations as they arise within the context of rapidly changing circumstances. Yes. It is unquestionable uh, that we have made great strides as a nation. We can boast of employment rate of 
literacy rate of 87.9%. And despite the crushing setback of current recession, growth in GDP of about 0.6%. Yet there is more to be done, and I believe that a renewed nationalism was a key to unlocking the incredible, I dare say, inexhaustible talents of all great people. How do I define renewed nationalism? In essence, it is time for Jamaica to sit up and ask who we are and what do we value. In other words, what does it mean to be Jamaican? I believe that renewed nationalism encompasses but is not limited to our pattern, which is far more elaborate than Ayri, Yemen, or Wagwan. <laughs> I believe that renewed nationalism encompasses our infectious reggae music, which has more words to it that is inspiring than the words one love. I believe renewed nationalism encompassing, encompasses our exquisite culinary palate, which is certainly more than ackee and selfish, and is far more than jerk. Renewed nationalism must also focus on actions that are to be taken to create an environment that is healthy, an environment which is dignified, an environment which is safe and secure, an environment which is inspiring, in which patriotic sentiments continues to develop and abound, an environment in which the politics of idea is promoted and not the politics of fear. It is a society where a greater percentage of the population plays a greater role in the decision-making process. For instance, in our most recent general election, last December, only 40% of those eligible to vote actually voted, a sign that urgent need is required in a system of political organization. We cannot claim to belong to a nation where the will of the people reigns supreme if people do not take an active interest in the politics as they become more and more disenchanted with a system that they perceive as being corrupt, a system that they perceive as being self-focused and unrelenting. A new Jamaican society should constitute one where decision-making process is brought closer to the people. A society where politicians always act in a manner consistent with the true strength of their conviction, rather than remain paralyzed by the vested interests of undeserving others. In our national pledge, each Jamaican dedicates him or herself to play his or her part so that Jamaica may undergo an increase in beauty, fellowship, and prosperity. Renewed nationalism within this context means fostering a climate where service to the development of nation is more coveted than the newest Vibes Cartel album, Aho, <laughs> or a pair of clubs, where the best and the brightest are encouraged to stay and serve their country to the greatest of their capabilities. Furthermore, I am a regionalist man. I am. I believe that Jamaicanness is in strip is in extremely linked to Caribbeanness. The sense that Jamaicans have an immense and irreplaceable role in forging a regional identity. Thus renewed nationalism is not only an interior looking policy, but an exterior looking one, seeking pathways through which Jamaicans can fulfill their pledge advancing the welfare of the whole human race. In simple terms, renewed nationalism signifies rekindling that unquenchable fire that helps us to fight for independence, that unquenchable fire that helps us to tackle social injustice, that unquenchable fire that propels us as Jamaicans not merely to see Jamaica from the seats of Kingston as, as constricted by geographic realities, but as full, unique participant in the regional and global arena. These are by no means grandiose objectives. Indeed, undaunted by the many challenges that will undoubtedly emerge, I believe that the action plan that must be employed as the main weapon in the arsenal of ideologies must be the ideology of pluralism. The fact of the matter is that the answer to Jamaica's problem, the solutions therein, do not only lie in those 
who occupies Belmont Road, which so happens to be the headquarters of one of our two major political parties. Nor are those who occupy the property at Old Oak Road, which is the headquarters of the northern of the, our two main political parties. Nor is it with the few who gather at Garden House, which so happens to be our houses of parliament. Pluralism involves generating a marketplace of ideas where every Jamaican, regardless of age, sex, income, or social status, is encouraged to participate in this Jamaican process. Differences are not converted into points of contention, but rather are cherished as they promote dialogue, which is more reflective of our social needs. Beyond the local landscape, a Herculean effort must be made to engage with all who possess an abiding and vested interest in Jamaica. We must harness intellectual and technical capabilities of the widest range of people possible. I cannot find words to adequately express how proud I am of my country's achievement of 50 years in independence and the progress we have made as a nation. Over pride has not drawn the curtains over my eyes. Neither has it inevitably covered my eyes with rose-colored glasses. The generation representing figuratively the gauge and the compass have fulfilled their role. It is high time for the current and future, future generation to pick up the mantle of the square, laying the foundations for the next 50 years, guided by a renewed sense of nationalism. Why make Despair possible and convincing when the possibilities of action and hope are endless. As Jamaicans pride ourselves as a unique and diverse blend of talented, diligent, loyal, visionary people, certainly supported entirely by our national pledge and our anthem. In fact, when we look at the words of our great Bamali, he demands that we put our vision to reality, that we wake up and live. We must, in the 21st century, be captains of our destiny and authors of our soul. This is what renewed nationalism means to me. And if we're willing, by the sweat of our brow and the labor of our hands, to work as our forefathers did, then we are assured of the promise of greater voter participation, assured of the promise of great opportunity for all and assured of the promise of greater leaders in the wider world. These aspirations are not mere fleeting illusions, not mere dreams to be pursued and never attained. Are we ready for a change in our national attitude as Jamaicans? Yes, we are. Are we capable of making that change? Yes, we are. Are we equipped with the personnel to make that change possible? Yes, we are. Are we convinced that a better Jamaica is possible? Yes, we are. Surely then. Yes, yes, yes. It is time to dream again. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for a very interesting presentation. I for bringing it in on time. Um, as I say, we'll allow time for questions at the end, uh, but first I'm going to invite our uh, second speaker to make his presentation. Um, this is uh, Stephen Wilson, uh, who hails from Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. He received his undergraduate and master's degrees from the uh, University of Oxford, and he is currently a doctoral uh, candidate in uh, politics at Oxford University and a part-time uh, psychiatry lecturer. St. Anne's College. Um, uh, Stephen's presentation is entitled Jamaica and Caribbean Integration. Uh, did one from ten more? Uh, I think it's going to be a panel. It is, yes. Uh, against my better judgment. <laughs> First of all, let me um, uh, 
thank you for allowing me to address you today. It's a privilege, um, and uh, I certainly will make sure that I come in on time to leave plenty of time for questions, um, because I look forward to hearing what you say probably a lot more than you're looking forward to hearing from me. Um, yes, and uh, my when you actually hear what I'm talking about, some of you might be disappointed and some of you might be relieved. It's perhaps less focused on the actual West Indian Federation than you might suppose, given the title. Um, it's a rather familiar quote. Um, but uh, what I'm hoping to speak to today is Jamaica and Caribbean integration and the special relationship um, that uh, Jamaican independence and Jamaican nationalism continues to have with um, regional integration. Uh, it's interesting that Andrew also mentioned that link uh, in his talk, uh, and I think it's probably a theme that will come up in other talks. Uh, and to talk about both, as the theme of this conference involves both looking back at what was over the last 50 years and taking a snapshot of what's happened, uh, and then also looking forward um, to what is perhaps possible and likely to happen in the future. Um, so rather ambitiously, I hope to address both of those aspects. Uh, as we move forward. So, uh, as has been mentioned somewhat, obviously, this year represents multiple anniversaries, right? So we have uh, the bicentennial of the independence of Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we also have, uh, it's been noted that this marks the beginning of the independence process, not only um, for Jamaica, but for the wider Commonwealth Caribbean. Um, this was the start of a process um, and a process that is not yet complete in some states, right? So this is, um, it's notable in that respect. It's also notable in that it marks the formal dissolution of the Federation of the West Indies, and therefore the beginning of a long, complicated road to regional integration. Um, the Federation in some ways represented a road that could have been, um, and separate independence represented uh, the road that was chosen. So. Uh, with that said, obviously, the regional dream did not die, uh, and regionalization has been a common aspiration in all Caribbean Commonwealth countries, and is something that politicians of all political stripes continue to make reference to. So, uh, no one is really against regionalization, but when it comes to the details, uh, it's something that's been very hard to form consensus around. Uh, and just some refreshers for those who aren't familiar with the end of the West Indian uh, Federation. Uh, obviously, there were many problems with uh, the West Indian Federation, uh, and it's not worth uh, rehashing all of the reasons in which it might have failed and all of the things that contributed to its failure. Uh, but for our purposes today, obviously, the Jamaican referendum in 1961 was certainly a catalyst and a principal instigator for uh, the series of events uh, that led to the collapse of the Federation. Um, not necessarily because of Jamaica's actions themselves, but because how those actions were perceived by uh, the wider Commonwealth of Caribbean, uh, most famously by Eric Williams, whose um, quote is the basis of my title. Uh, it's uh, some other points that I think are interesting to make with regard to the West Indian Federation is that Jamaica did hold a somewhat a uh, special place within the political party structure such as it existed uh, within the West Indian Federation and in that both of the major West Indian parties were uh, led uh, by Jamaicans. Um, one of the problems with the Federation, of course, is that the incentives for political office within the Federation were not significant enough to induce key political leaders like Williams and Norman Manley to give up uh, their national level offices to seek offices within the Federation. Uh, so there was a two-tier system, and, and the principal politicians and those commanded, that commanded the most uh, popular support back home tended to stay out of the uh, West Indian Federation. But nevertheless, the two parties themselves centered around Jamaica, so Jamaica did have a special role within the party system. Um, and the other, I think, point is that uh, it wasn't a terribly robust federation institutionally uh, when you look at the world in a comparative context. Right? So it lacked a custom union and a common currency. So many of the aspects, uh, while it, meet, it meets Casey uh, Weir's minimal definitions for the definition of federation and also uh, Rikers, it, 
in some ways looks more like conventional confederations and had a very loose uh, structure and a very weak central government. Uh, it was quite akin to the United States under the Articles of Confederation rather than the United States under the American Constitution as it now stands. Uh, so it was not the dissolution of a, of a proper, fully institutionalized federation as we now think. So even in that stage, uh, there remained a lot of uh, integration, regional integration as we think of it, to be done. However, Jamaica held a referendum uh, in 1961 and uh, against the wishes of uh, Norman Manley, uh, Jamaica voted to leave the West Indian Federation. Uh, and for the purpose of our talk, the most interesting thing in my mind is the perception that this created um, in Eric Williams and in other leaders uh, in the Caribbean and around the world, which was that uh, without Jamaica, federation was impossible. Um, so Jamaica was seen as an essential component of any workable federal structure. Uh, the reason for this was that the, uh, there was seen, there were certain assumptions behind thinking about federation and integration at the time. And the assumptions, uh, which we'll go into detail in a minute, were essentially that any workable structure would involve subsidization, that you would need stronger, larger nations like Jamaica, like Trinidad and Tobago, to effectively carry the smaller states. These are states that later became the Associated States in the Caribbean uh, and are now largely in the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Um, so the idea was that you needed these central spoke nations to provide that cross-subsidization uh, for the smaller, less developed states. And uh, this pointing the finger uh, at Jamaica for leaving, I think, has uh, created a lasting divide between what are sometimes referred to as more developed countries, or MDCs, uh, and uh, less developed countries, LDCs, um, since in international relations and uh, the UN, everything has to have an abbreviation, so that's what that means. <laughs> uh, so, what did that leave us with, right? So, Federation ended, but that was obviously not the end of our regional aspirations. So we have CARICOM, which was established in 1973, and some of you are saying yes, but that wasn't the actual first thing. Yes, there was the Caribbean Free Trade Area, CARIFTA, which was actually based on the European Free Trade Area, which was Britain's alternative to the European Economic Community, because uh, France vetoed and kept it out of it. So, there's that background. But, uh, CARICOM is the institution in which many Caribbean regionalists have placed their hopes that this dual identity as both Jamaicans and West Indians and members of the Caribbean wider community can be actualized. Uh, and the um, three broad areas in which it acts are coordination of foreign policy, functional cooperation, in which uh, the University of the West Indies is one of the most shining examples uh, of its success in functional cooperation, and economic integration. Uh, and, uh, oh yes, and it, and it should also be mentioned in passing, people might ask about this, and I don't know very much about it, but uh, Jamaica did contribute to um, the creation of CARICOM uh, from CARIFTA, obviously with uh, Michael Manley and uh, it being quite supportive. Uh, so once again, the, uh, the moves forward in the Caribbean regionalization front have been seen as needing Jamaica to be on board, needing Jamaica to take a uh, leadership role in the region. Uh, and this has been a role that Jamaica has seen itself as fulfilling and that other nations in the region have seen um, Jamaica as needing to provide an essential role. The other uh, uh, project for regionalization is the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, or the OECS which was uh, created by the Treaty of Esther in 1981. Uh, it, it has a regional security system, a central bank, a Supreme Court, a secretary, joint diplomatic representation, and in 2011 they've entered a treaty for full economic union. Um, so they've had quite a, quite a wide range of achievements um, in that area. Uh, interestingly, um, I won't get into all the citations, but uh, 
the Jamaican newspapers tend to look at, whenever the OECS is mentioned in Jamaica, it always seems to be mentioned as a tag on that it's a sub national grouping within CARICOM, uh, which seems to me to be somewhat defensive in how it's viewed. But uh, it, it's not in conflict with CARICOM, but it's, uh, these are states that are also in CARICOM, but which have achieved a high, very high level of functional integration uh, and supranational governance uh, amongst themselves. Um, and, and have in many ways gone far further than, than CARICOM as a larger grouping. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a limited breadth, but it's, it's, it's a far deeper level of integration that they've been allowed to achieve. Uh, and here we can look at some assumptions about Caribbean integration. Uh, and this is uh, borrowed uh, and is distilled from the work of uh, uh, Professor Walter Matley, who looks at the logic of regional integration generally. Uh, and the question I'm posing is, uh, why has the OECS been able to go further and deeper than CARICOM? And what role, uh, and does Jamaica continue to fulfill the role that it has traditionally seen itself as fulfilling, i.e. a necessary and essential role in the further advancement of Caribbean integration, or not? Uh, and the reason Jamaica is seen as essential is because it's seen, like Trinidad and Tobago, as fulfilling a role similar to Germany in the European Union, right? It's a central hub state that, provide, that is able to provide cross-subsidies to uh, counteract the inevitable inefficiencies and losers in integration, because in any, in any change there's going to be winners and losers. Uh, the common assumption is that the less developed countries are smaller, will enjoy fewer economies of scale, have a lot to lose in a common market, and therefore someone has to carry the, block, the uh, majority of the weight in regards to paying for the major institutions of regional government, and that Jamaica and Trinidad are the two nations that are supposed to do it. Trinidad, of course, unwilling to do this uh, by itself. Um, the interesting thing about this model, um, and I, I'm not sure if everyone can read it, it seems readable from here, but uh, I, I can provide more information if anyone's interested. Uh, but that, uh, that the assumption is that the benefit, that there's demand and there's supply. Supply is willing political leadership, and a regional coordinator like Jamaica willing to bear those responsibilities, which people are waiting for in CARICOM. And, and the demand is basically the benefits that can be gained for regional integration, which are primarily economies of scale uh, and complementary regional economies and organized economic actors that stand to benefit in concrete, real terms from integration. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, in my view, is that if you look at what has actually happened, uh, is that the OECS actually meets far fewer of these criteria than CARICOM. CARICOM has more complementary economies, there's far greater capacity for intra-regional trade, trade within the Caribbean region, within the wider CARICOM space, than there is between OECS. The OECS economies, of course, are very, very similar to one another. There's not great scope for trade between them. Uh, and to me, what this speaks to is the idea that uh, what regional integration has been about and what has made it successful is the actualization of identities, of political identities, that it expands beyond the scope of functional economic integration or uh, integration for the purposes of furthering trade, but that the primary benefits have been uh, in terms of representing Caribbean interests with respect to uh, common foreign policy representation, trade negotiations with uh, Euro Europe and North America, um, and enjoying effectively public administration economies of scale by sharing expertise and sharing resources and actually having supranational governance. Uh, and uh, that that's what you have, because in, in, in CARICOM, uh, despite the uh, apparent passage of the Caribbean single market and economy, uh, interregional trade remains very low, and what regional trade there is, uh, overwhelmingly most of that is accounted for by uh, petroleum shipments from Trinidad, right? So very little of it uh, is something that can really be traced directly to uh, the CSME. Um, and, and so the record on that has been decidedly underwhelming. Um, the OECS has had far more success. Uh, 
that quite the kind of thing. Okay. I don't think I'm quite. Yes. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, the OECS has, uh, has, has demonstrated success in all the areas where, where CARICOM has, has uh, failed. And although it's, um, as I say, a much smaller grouping of nations, uh, it, it, uh, it has managed that deeper level of integration. Looking forward to the next 50 years, uh, and, and as this is mentioned, uh, I think as the High Commissioner pointed out before, 50 years is a very long time, uh, particularly in politics where, where, two, where a week is a very long time. Uh, so making predictions for the future uh, is difficult. However, uh, what I think we will see is the potential for more functional integration at the sub-regional level, right? Uh, and, and effectively what this is is that uh, if we're looking for a grand bargain, a grand federation of everyone, all the Commonwealth Caribbean nations coming together and agreeing on a grand comprehensive treaty to qualitatively advance regionalization to a higher plane, that that's unlikely to happen. Uh, but what you do see uh, is both continued progress of the OECS, but you also have seen uh, attempts to build on the US OECS in political ways. So there has been a proposed uh, economic union between Barbados and the OECS. It didn't quite come together, but it was proposed. Uh, and there have been growing and growing linkages between Barbados and the OECS. Uh, and there was also the uh, Manning Initiative, which, which actually uh, apparently uh, advanced rather detailed levels of negotiation, which was envisioning a political and economic union between Trinidad and the OECS, uh, which looks unlikely to have to go forward now, given the present composition of the government in Trinidad. But uh, it looked for a while like that was a very serious possibility. Uh, it wasn't simply empty rhetoric. A lot of groundwork was done in those negotiations. So, okay. yeah. uh, so, so there's a... Uh, I'm not being as, as succinct as I hoped. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, there's the potential for, for building on the OECS or small regional groupings and advancing at that level. And what I think that means uh, is that Jamaican influence within the region will remain strong, but its participation will not be perceived as essential or necessary. Uh, I think the idea that uh, Jamaica, the Caribbean integration can only move forward when Jamaica decides it's ready and joins the conversation is not true, uh, and that there is the prospect for regional integration projects uh, that don't involve Jamaica. Uh, I'm not saying that the strongest regional Caribbean grouping wouldn't involve Jamaica, because it would, um, but I think that uh, there's, there's the potential for Jamaica not to be involved in key decisions if they don't join the table. Uh, and, and become part of the conversation as negotiations uh, and the regionalization process moves forward. So, that's what I'll put out there and start the conversation. I look forward to hearing people's comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Alton Bell, my name is. I'd like to ask Andrew uh, a question just to kick off this uh, part of it. Now, Andrew, in your presentation about uh, Jamaican Jubilee, a time for renewed nationalism, what I want to ask you is this, because I, I, I think you pointed to or alluded to a few things, but never gave us any uh, substantive ways to do this. And the question I want to ask you is this, for Jamaica to grow up, i.e. and shake off the shackles of the Willie Lynch theory and so forth, how will this happen and how will we work together?
I mean, there is clearly a need for us to reorganize ourselves politically. We have made great political strides, but I, I did point out that having 40% of those who are eligible to vote in your country voting in a general election is simply not good enough in the 21st century. And I think what's at the center of it is how we do politics. And what I said is, we have just got to move from the classic way of organizing politics, where we organize based on consensus, to a more interactionist approach. And the best way of doing that is embracing the model, or the ideology model, of pluralism, where each Jamaican really and truly get a chance to play a part in the decision making process. And I think that first, so we get over that, is the first term. There's a number of things we, we can look at. There are a range of options. And I can go further into the range of options. Do we still stick with the first past the post model in our elections? Or should we move to a more, to a more proportional representation type model? So there are a number of things which spin off. I mean, not to say much more, I belong than there is a member of a party that certainly like the other political, the political parties in Jamaica, that can be proud of the advances in the society as a country. But do I think that in the 21st century, looking at the forces which are at play, are we as democratic as we ought to be? I think not. I think there is room for us to improve if Jamaica is going to arrive to secure this in the 21st century. And political pluralism is. I, I appropriated the mic, so I guess I get to answer, ask the question. It's really a comment uh, directed at Steve's paper. Um, Steve, uh, to be devil's advocate, because I'm a regionalist by nature, by name and nature, but uh, what are the reasons why Jamaica would not be uh, interested in close integration? Uh, and and what, is it, what are the traditions in, in, in Jamaican politics that would lead it away from integration? I think first, and, and most obvious one, has to do with the fact that Jamaica is a thousand miles away from the Eastern Caribbean. And its natural historical <coughs> connections have been with the Northern Caribbean, with Cuba, as well as the Western Caribbean, uh, the, the, littoral, the Central American littoral. And therefore, there is a historic geographical reason which helps to explain that. And so what you're probably going to see in the immediate future is a closer Jamaican link with the Northern Caribbean, perhaps as an avenue into a renewed link with the Eastern Caribbean. I think it's one of the first things that we need to look at. The second point I want to make, and I'll end here, uh, is uh, a diplomatic one. And that is, uh, I think it was, this part has been made repeatedly, but uh, there is still a diplomatic interest in not having a single Caribbean voice in the international uh, world, but a number of voices which may act together more, more often than not. But I think this is a critical question against a uh, movement towards closer unity, which needs to be balanced against the obvious advantages of acting as a single unified federation in the immediate future. So um, there are just a variety of, 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 um, of devil's advocate questions which I think need to be asked and understood in the overall look at the relationship of Jamaica to the Eastern Caribbean, which I think uh, Norman Manley didn't understand, but Alexander Bustamante understood better than that Oh, oh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, yes, well, I, I, was, ex I was expecting uh, something along this line. That's good. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think you're quite right. I mean, I think there are a lot of things that mitigate against closer regionalization. I mean, geography is often mentioned that Jamaica is uh, very far away um, from the rest of the Commonwealth Caribbean uh, and is in some ways a geographical outlier um, and water has separated more than united in, in, in the context of the Caribbean. Uh, I mean I think the same, I don't think there are particularly special factors within Jamaican politics that lead against uh, in regionalization, uh, I think there's some of the same forces that would be active anywhere, which is, you know, local political interests, obviously people who are in, in positions of power uh, under the current national government 
would not particularly be enthused about giving that up to some hypothetical regional government. Um, so there's political self-interest, um, because Jamaica is not a unitary actor. There's no Jamaican perspective. There are many Jamaican perspectives. Um, uh, so, but the people who make the decision are the political leaders who are going to have an inbuilt aversion to losing power, which is natural among any politician. So I think uh, that's part of the role. Um, in terms of the benefits of integration versus not, I think it's a very interesting point. I mean, that's something that's being talked about with Scotland, is that you know, if, if the UK were to break up, you know, there would actually be sort of more votes, as it were, within Europe or within the United Nations from Britain as an island than if Britain were a unitary actor. Uh, so there's, there's something to be said for, uh, e e even if there aren't uh, economies of scale, within the Caribbean that simply because there are so many voices uh, that there's benefits to be gained uh, simply because there's a certain inherent benefit just to having the trappings of sovereignty uh, and that you have that many times over within the Caribbean. Um, and I think, you know, the right balance is uh, something different. But being by regionalization, I think you simply need more decisions being taken through institutions at the regional level. So. In my mind, that doesn't necessarily involve a return to an actual federation, for example. Uh, that could simply be greater supranational governance in the context of the EU. So nations within the EU are able to leverage the benefits of a larger area, uh, but still maintain sovereignty. And so I think that's uh, something that the Caribbean is likely to follow. Uh, but you're right, I think the OECS could be more likely to head into, you know, I mentioned outright political union. Um, and uh, I do think what you might see, for example, is an OECS political union that then uh, together engages in some new level of uh, treaty reorganization within CARICOM with Jamaica and Trinidad, and that that would go some way to equalizing the relationship. Uh, you wouldn't have uh, so many small disparate voices and then two large voices with uh, Barbados as sort of a middle, middling voice, I suppose. Um, but those are... Those are important points, but yeah. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm a student. This question also goes to Stephen. In your research, did you find that regional integration moved more quickly along when you had center-left governments as opposed to center-right governments um, in power at the time? And going forward, do you believe that there would need to be a coalescing of center-left governments in order to get to that level or to get to a deeper level of regional integration? That's an interesting question. Um, and, and unfortunately, I don't feel like I have a definitive answer on it. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not willing to say that I've seen or, or would stand by any correlation with the center-left. Um, and, 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 and acquiescence or, or support for integration. I mean, I think what you do tend to see is that regardless of the positions parties have taken in the past, when they are um, in opposition, they tend to oppose whatever the, the, the government's doing. Um, so part, you know, and you see this in every country, in the United States as well. But, uh, so I think you see, you see parties that are on record as potentially supporting something, but then if they're not in the positions of power to negotiate it, would rather it happen under their watch. Uh, and equally, maybe parties in opposition go on record as supporting giving away power, that then when they themselves have power, they become somewhat reluctant to give it away. And in a lot of these negotiations, it's difficult sometimes to point out exactly who caused it to break down. So, you know, the historical judgment is cloudy. Uh, could I get both panelists' views on Jamaica as uh, becoming a republic, pros and cons. Certainly, like of recent, recent utterance, I'm sure, on this question. So that's not been a meeting and this question was asked. Um, I, I certainly share my personal view, the, the view I share, certainly is by no means attached to any organization, institution um, that I support and remember. The, the simple view is, if it is time for Jamaica to become a republic, I think it must be a decision for the people of Jamaica. 
and it's the people to take us to the future of the land. Yes, sir, well, I don't think it's really my place, but I do think there are some advantages to being in the Commonwealth. But I would say it's, it, that's a totally a self-determination position for the Jamaican people, and I think there's pros and cons to stop for an outsider to say. I just want to make a few very, very quick points. Um, we seem to be avoiding certain truths. Let's go at the Federation first start. Isn't it a fact that the Federation was used as a political hot cake at the time to scare people in Jamaica? If you look at some of the rhetoric at the time, it was said that if Jamaica was to be part of the Federation, it would weaken Jamaica economically and politically. And lots of people have bought into that. That was the doctrine of Bustamante. Polls show, before that was mentioned, many Jamaicans were pro-Federation. Once it became a political issue, with that as a head, they changed their attitude. That has to be addressed. And nobody in the panel is actually saying that. We're scared to say. The second point about whether or not um, integration works better for left of center parties or right of center parties. The gentleman at the back, the OECS, some of the leading figures of the OECS, John Compton of St. Lucia, Eugenia Charles of Dominica, they were right of center part of thinkers, not left of center thinkers. Uh, I think it's important that we stress that particular point. The other final point I want to make is this. Uh, this is more for Steve to answer. Is it that the OACS is a stronger as an organization because of economic necessity? It was the fact that international institutions would not borrow money to the smaller islands because they didn't have the collateral to back it up. So the OACS came into formation as an, as an entity to allow these smaller states to be able to borrow money on the world market. And without that, they were not able to function. So this is another thing I'd like Steve to, 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 to explore. And also whether or not the nature of the politicians at the time in the OSCS were more forward thinking than the politicians of the larger Caribbean area. Yes, yes. Uh, well, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll try and be very brief, but I, I think uh, broadly with respect to the OECS, I think uh, that you're correct that the OECS was, was, was faced with much stronger um, constraints. And so w once they proceeded to independence on their own, as much smaller uh, countries, um, they had a lot more to lose and a lot more to gain um, by, by, by joining together to a certain extent. For example, it's, it's very hard to imagine them maintaining separate currencies. So, so that's true. Yeah. Um, I have had two questions, um, somewhat asked by the first two presenters for Steve, but I guess I'll try to rephrase it in a different way. Um, how do you view um, regionalism within the context of sovereignty? Because I think part of the issue is that as independent states, uh, regionalism somewhat challenges its um, nations are starting their independence and so can you give your views on that and for um, Andrew um, your renewed nationalism or your concept of renewed nationalism I think now that we have become independent there is no fight for a nation anymore and so what has supplanted that or taken its place is an individual type culture and so people are more self-interested as opposed to... Um, so we, we are nationalistic, but we are more individualistic than we are nationalistic. And so what is the response to this individualism that I think accounts for your 40 odd percent turnout? Uh, yeah, well, 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 first, if anyone has any questions for me, I'd, I'd be happy to take them after, um, if you want to chase me down. Uh, <laughs> um, 
But yes, uh, to, to the question of, of, of uh, the relationship between uh, sovereignty and regionalization, I mean, they're, they're often juxtaposed, obviously. Um, and I think there's an inevitable trade off between uh, national decision making um, capacity uh, and regional decision making capacity, but there's not necessarily a trade off between sovereignty and regionalization. So, regionalism can take a, a variety of forms. Uh, and it can uh, accommodate uh, the, the essentials of sovereign states, meaning uh, ind you know, independent um, sovereign legal systems um, and, and separate uh, uh, diplomatic representations, but can nevertheless result in a, a wide array of collaboration and integration in the judicial arenas, in the trade arenas. Um, and, and in a whole variety of areas. So I, I don't think the two are necessarily opposed, um, but I do think uh, that, that successful regionalism always has to build on, on an identity. So as part of the European Union project, there was a lot of work going into creating a European identity and, and, and getting people to talk about that and creating symbols that people can focus on. And I think to a certain extent that does exist in the Caribbean, uh, and to a certain extent, uh, there, there's, there's work to be done, but I think the two can coexist, um, and, and, and it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, everything that's done to promote Jamaican identity is necessarily eroding away from people's West Indian identity. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a zero-sum game anywhere else in the world, and I don't see why it should be here either. Uh, so, so uh, yes, but, but to me, to, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> Well, um, thank you. I think it's an um, <clears throat> analysis that is spot on. And to answer your question directly, what accounts for it, it would have been the politics of the day. Um, but certainly, most of our unipolar world. And therefore, along with it, we have embraced globalization. And part of the force of globalization is the individual interest. And it is the very essence of that. Um, which is at the root of the nationalism, because it is not saying that we can take away this individualism from it. It is simply saying we need to find a better way of harnessing this individualism. We need to find a better way of making sure that the creativity and innovation that is within the individual can be more focused so that the country, Jamaica land, will prosper. Okay, I'm very sorry to come to a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much.